So on a previous episode, we talked, we compared some figs and talked about that Black Malta, how that was our favorite and a good one. Now this one here has rave reviews, and uh, this is a first year tree that's putting on uh, a few. I've already tried a couple of them. This is a variety called Improved Celeste. And a lot of our friends on the Row by Row group, uh, I've talked to a lot of customers, they rave and rave about this variety here. So I figured I'd uh, let you give them a shot there. A little on the green side. Now I had one that was uh, on the vine that had gotten too ripe. But uh, so I picked these. I think these are, are, are a little closer than what that one was, yeah, was too ripe. A little hard to compare apples to oranges and oranges to apples. Right, we don't have a, I don't have a malt to, to grab. Well, that's a nice clean. That is a nice good fig. Uh, Malta, still pretty, pretty tough. Clean, nice clean kind of taste to it. Uh, I don't know. I really like it. I would say it's more of a honey type than it's the berry, yeah. but um, I, I, I see why so many people like it. Kind of leaning more toward those real dark figs. I think it may be a mental thing. I think it is too. I think it, I think it is a bit of a mental thing. A uh, couple of things we need to go over here. We've been working on getting all of our seed starting kits back in stock because we know it's time for people to be starting seeds for fall. And uh, we've got our smaller kits back on the website. We made a couple changes. I'm going to go over that here. I might need to stand up for this. Um, we made a couple changes I wanted to kind of go over and discuss here. So this is our 48 cell kit. I'll show you the difference between this and our other one. This is what it looks like when you get it. Um, so we, we went with a little different card there as far as the instructions go. Hold that. So it's pretty much the same thing we used to get you. Two of these, two 24, this is 24 insert. You get two of those, that's what we call it a 48. Hold on, let's 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 just get it all out. Get here. it all out. Okay, so this is our 48 cell kit. So there's two 24 cell trays here. You get the bottom tray, you get the dome to go with it. So you can do 48 plants in these, um, which is a, a good amount for you know any kind of small size garden or whatever. We got nice instructions here, nice kind of um, thick paper there should so keep up with that changes we made we discussed this on last week's show so we switched to this sun grow uh, seed starting mix because it was more available it was easier for us to get and also we've been doing some testing and it, it is less chunky than some of the pro mix we've been getting and we really like this stuff so uh, you get one of these with these kits here one of these eight quart bags which is enough to fill both these trays and another thing we did is we went now when we first started doing these kits we tried to to use an organic fertilizer and what we've learned over the years is is there's just not really a good quote organic way to fertilize seedlings you got to get it to them fast it's got to be fast acting you really don't have time to wait on an organic fertilizer to convert over so we got our 20 20 20 here we got it with a little spoon there. We got easy directions. You basically mix one of these scoops with a gallon of water. When you get your first true leaves on there, on your plants. Take you, a water and can and just water them nice. Water them can, water them from the top, and uh, you're good to go. So, and there's enough in here for four fertilizations, plenty enough for all the seedlings you'll be growing in here. Uh, a lot of people ask about the domes. Uh, do you leave them on? You know, how long do you leave them on? Uh, you know, typically you want to leave the domes on there until all the seeds germinate, then you take the domes off. As far as watering goes, uh, a mistake I see people doing is they, they will, um, they got this bottom tray and they think that means they should only water from the bottom. But initially, until those seedlings get roots growing down there, I, I don't. the water will not necessarily wick all the way up to the top. So I recommend watering from the top 
at least initially, until the roots can get down into the bottom, then you can let that reservoir down there feed the plants. So the bottom tray acts twofold. So if you do want a bottom water, once your plants get big enough, it's a fine situation for that. It's also a catch bottom for you all that has to do it inside your carport or inside your house when you are doing that top watering. So when you do that top watering, you don't have to worry about it getting all over your furniture or whatever to catch that moisture underneath it. Now you don't want to water so much you got water standing in here. So you want to kind of keep that, especially when you're starting. You, you want to make sure that you keep this kind of drained off when you're starting to get your seeds to germinate there. Keep your seeds starting mix moist. You don't need a huge pool of water in the bottom of this thing. Let me show everybody the differences in our uh, other kits here. So our we have our that was our 48 cell kit. We've got a 24 cell kit where you get two of these setups here. You get the 12 cell tray, the dome, uh, so all the, the soil, the markers, fertilizer, all the same stuff there. So that's our smallest kit, the 24 cell kit. And then the deluxe kit here is similar to the uh, 48 cell kit, but you've got this nice kind of hard rigid yeah. dome on there. And both of your inserts, these are the inserts you get. Take that dome off there, please, sir. The inserts fit in there just like that. You got a little wiggle room in there. Um, so that's the deluxe kit. And it, uh, it comes with the soil, the fertilizer, the markers too. So we've got all those small kits back in stock. Now, a lot of people are going to ask about the premium kit. We should have those bottom trays in the next week or two, I think. We should. We've got a decent amount of, I mentioned on one of our previous shows, believe it or not, We've been able to, our supplier on these trays and everything has been pretty consistent. Probably we've been having this potting soil or the seeding mix. We may have a little bit of disruption there when we go out of stock, but we got a decent supply in now and, and they have promised us to get us another truckload in here before long. So we're hoping that that comes in. We have no disruption of out of inventory, but we could see a little bit of problem there, but, uh, Let's hope for the and those bottom trays for our big trays, we got a whole container of those coming. Uh, so we ought to have plenty of those for Hopefully quite a while. Hopefully we have them next week, yep. Uh, and then we can get those other kits back in stock. So we got a kit for whatever scale you're working with there. If you just need to do 20 or so plants, 50 plants, or 160 something plants. Um, what else? So let me show you a little something what I've been working on. Okay. Speaking of those seed starter sure, kits. Sure, sure. I'm going to eat so the rest of my fig right here. Those seed starter kits, this tray right here is the bottom tray. Mm -hmm. So what I've been working on is some microgreen kits. Mm -hmm. We use the same exact potting soil or seeding mix that we use in our seed starting kit in this same bottom tray. Now I didn't use the dome, but you could use the dome when you started. But what we have here, folks, is buckwheat. And this is a microgreen, so this is ready to eat right now. It's ready another, cut. I had another flat I ate some of yesterday. But I'm beginning to get to the point where I always want a fresh supply of greens. And sometimes we just can't do that out in the garden all the time. And some people may be limited on the way they grow, if they grow on a patio or if they live in an apartment, whatever. So I'm working on creating a process and a products and some kits so you can grow these right here and have a fresh supply of greens at all times. Now who would have thunk? Those aren't bad. But wheat. But wheat. Makes a good microgreen, but it does. Now you can eat, I ate a sandwich yesterday and loaded it up with this here but wheat. And then last night, the wife made me a pasta salad and we loaded uh -oh. it up with but wheat. You gonna let me try some of that? Well, I'm not. But what I'm trying to say is these salads uh, you cut this one time? Cut this one time, yeah. But these salads here, and we can do several different ones. You know, they say sunflowers is the most popular. They have kind of a nutty flavor to it. Right. But you can do peas, you can do sunflowers, you can do but we if we got here, you can do several different ones that lend themselves to a good microgreen so you can have these healthy greens all at one time. Now those are good on a sandwich too, right? Oh yeah, I did that yesterday. I fixed me a good smoked turkey sandwich yesterday and loaded it up there. So you always got that. You know, start you one about every week and then you got a constant supply, regardless of what the weather is. So that's what I've been working on is creating these right here. 
Now still got a little work to do on the process because when I get through these, I want to give you exact instructions on how you can be successful growing these. So we're still working on that. But we should look have at that. that I'll show people this right here. See, you're supposed to get this dense mat right there. And they're easy to clean up. You just kind of yep. dump it all out of there. Yeah, so in between your successions of whatever it may be, cabbage, broccoli, or whatever, and using these trays, you can utilize them as another food source here uh, between your successions uh, of starting your transplants and stuff. Is that pretty good? It's pretty good. I don't know if I'm going to let you have any. Uh, you, I, think I ain't got a fork, so I'll let you enjoy it. You know, it. something else, and we'll get into this later on, radishes make good microgreens. Radishes. Broccoli makes good microgreens. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, arugula. Arugula. Yeah, lots of good peas. People use peas a lot of times. They use this particular variety called dun peas. Yeah. And, and is it like a field pea or sweet I'm pea? I'm not sure. I guess still got some work to do on that. Hmm. So you've been working on getting a microgreen program together and I've been working on, and, and I'm pretty close to it. I, I would say uh, I might be a month or two out on it, working on getting um, a new irrigation kit type setup for people who have container gardens uh, and also for people who have some fruit trees on the homestead they want to water. So we're gonna have two different kits. They'll be similar, just the the different the quantities of the pieces in them will be a little bit different. And this is gonna be kind of professional grade stuff, just like our drip kits. Way better than what you're gonna go at the big blue store, big orange store and get. Um, so our container kit is gonna work really well for those of you, and I see it all the time, people have either uh, they have little boxes or maybe they have like pots just in a long row and that's their garden. They grow a bunch in these five gallon pots. They just have them stacked in a line and we're gonna have a nice little kit where you can just go out there, turn it on, you can water all those really well, nicely. What if you're on yep. vacation? Yep. Container garden has really caught on the last few years. It works well for some people that are limited on their space. You normally don't have near the weed pressure there. The only drawback to container gardening is water. Mm -hmm. They take more water because they're out of the ground and they drain. And the soil inside of them is usually some potting mix, not necessarily like in-ground soil, so it doesn't retain water as yeah, well. Yeah, so if you are into container gardening, you will find this irrigation system to be a huge benefit. Yeah, and then for those of you who've got some fig trees like I do, maybe some blackberries or whatever kind of fruit trees, we're gonna have a nice, easy, it's a setup you can customize to about any size layout uh, and, and make it easy to water your fruit trees. I can tell you firsthand from having about 30 fig trees, it is a pain in the neck to go out there and water them by hand every other afternoon. So having something where you can just turn it on, set it and forget it, and keep everything nice and happy. Yeah, this is gonna be a low volume system, so you don't have to worry about having a huge well or a huge supply of water. Heck, you could water 30 or 40 trees just off the average water system. Mm -hmm. yep, so it's yep. gonna be designed so that you can put it in, work off your well or your city water, county water, or whatever, and be able to water those fruit trees and not lose any to evaporation or runoff. Because it's an emitter and it's a slow system that puts out uh, the emitter is going to put out about a gallon per hour. So if you put two to a tree, you're putting out two gallons per tree per hour. Mm -hmm. Which is a good bit of water. Yep. Yeah, so a lot of the components will be the same. Our filter regulator combo, our mainline tubing, the mainline T, the mainline elbow. The only thing to really be different is the actual emitters that you plug into uh, the main line itself, the spaghetti tubing, and then the little, um, I forget what they call them, the, the little anchors that kind of direct exactly where the water goes. One of the main things we've really worked at on this irrigation thing is making it easy to install. That's right. Uh, we got a, we just got about four days of rain, uh, which cooled everything off and now it's struck back hot and humid. But uh, I've been seeing, uh, first time I've seen one in my yard, I think we did a, a post a video to Instagram uh, yesterday or today about this. I had a fairy ring in my yard. We used to see them a lot on the golf courses when I worked at the golf course in college, but I had a fairy ring of, of mushroom heads in my yard uh, popped up after all that moisture. Mm -hmm. Um, so we, we got a lot of moisture. We didn't really get any wind or anything off that first one. My friends over there in 
uh, West Louisiana and East, Southeast Texas. Uh, we hope everybody over there stays safe. And uh, as uh, was it Laura comes through there, this seems to be a pretty active hurricane season. Yep. And uh, it's not beyond the realm of possibility that we get one over here before it's all over with. Absolutely. So our thoughts and prayers are out to everybody in the, in the path of that bad boy or bad girl. That's right. Uh, one of the last things to mention here is, uh, people, you know, still have people asking when we're going to cedars, when we're going to get this back in stock. And uh, what has happened this year, folks, is we have slapped run out of room back there. Run out of room, uh, run out of help, run out of a lot of things to be able to put stuff together. And, and what I, I guess a lot of people don't realize, and I, I try to convey this to people about the cedars, those cedars, they, they take a long time for us to assemble. And so it's not something that we can assemble during the season that is right now still where we're focused on getting your orders out on time. Now, usually we do have see a little bit of a slowdown in the fall, and that's when we build all of our cedar inventory for the following year. Because when we're focused on shipping, getting orders out, order volume is high, we don't have time to put together cedar. So our cedar assembly time is coming up soon, will be within the next few months. And that will be when we try to forecast, which we didn't do a good job of this year, no. but we try to forecast how many we're gonna need for the following year. So that's the hold up on the cedars. It just, it's a time consuming, labor intensive process, getting them assembled. And when you're doing thousands and thousands of them, it takes a lot of manpower, takes a lot of time, takes a lot of warehouse space. And we're working on getting more warehouse space. I'll let you give a little update on that. Well, we're having to do some site work and we're back there working on it now. We was rolling pretty good, but then we got that rain in here and it stopped everything. So we're really excited about our new warehouse expansion. It's gonna be somewhere in the neighborhood of 24,000 square feet, which is gonna give us a lot of room to breathe. Basic quadrupling what we got now. Yeah, but the dirt works really this rain. We need some dry weather to get started. We got everything lined up, but y'all all know how construction is. One little monkey wrench in there and it kind of throws everything out of whack. And that's where we're all right now. We need some dry weather to get this dirt in here and get the compaction done so we can get the concrete folks in here and get the building up going. Cause let me tell you something, I am ready. I'm ready to be able to walk around and breathe a little bit and have a little room to put some inventory make things a lot nicer and easier on everybody here in the front and in the back. What is it y'all? Nine feet of dirt you have to bring in? Nine feet. Nine feet. That's a lot in of dirt. The, in the close between 500 and a thousand loads of dirt. Big loads. Big loads. Big loads. But well, we're gonna get there. We're gonna get there. They uh they run in and uh hopefully soon we'll have plenty of extra warehouse space we can keep everything inventory and we, we're going to make a commitment we're going to try to do a lot better job next year keeping everything in stock all the time all right this week's show uh since that time's coming up we'll be starting our seeds pretty soon i want to talk about cool season crop rotations we've talked about crops you can grow in the cool season uh this week i want to talk about kind of planting strategies of what you may what you may want to plant beside each other if you're working with multiple plots like we do what kind of crops you want to put in the same plot what in another plot and and kind of your rotation now this is going to be a little bit different for everybody down here where we are we're planting all winter long all fall long we're we're you know, we can start, I can start around the cabbage in a, a month, then I can turn around a month later, start another round, start another, however we want to do it. Now, some of you may get to the point where it's too cold, so your succession may not be as long as ours, but we're going to look at it from the aspect of growing food year round, which is what we do. And, and some of you, even if you do live up north, may have high tunnels or, high tunnels or something that allows you uh, to extend your season. So here where we're at now, I'm in my garden, I'm getting ready to turn what cover crops I got out there in, mm -hmm. and I'm getting ready to prepare everything for this fall plant because it's time. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. Now I was talking to our one of our seed reps today, does a lot of work with the Vidalia onions up there, and he says if you're going to grow onions from seed and you, you know, pull your transplants and have them ready to go in November, you need to be getting seed bed ready. They've already started planting some of the varieties of seed for the Vidalia onions. So if you're in zone eight, 
probably need to think about getting that bed ready if you're going to grow your onions from seed that you see it's this time. And you still, we're going to show people how to do that, right? Yep. Um, so speaking, let's first start, let's first before we talk about any kind of rotations, uh, ro we do rotations with warm season crops, cool season crops, rotations are very, very important. And if you're struggling with pests that get worse and worse every year, if you've got a garden that's been in the same spot for, you know, 10, 15, 20 years, and it just seems to kind of just production slowly slack off year after year, it's likely a result of a lack of rotation. You need to be rotating these crop families. Each crop family has its own kind of set of pests and diseases that can have issues with it, soil borne stuff. And, and the more you can rotate, the, the better you're gonna have um, uh, the better success you're going to have with growing each individual crop. Cover cropping does help uh, speed up that rotation time, but we always want to be really, really uh, aware of not planting the same family in the same spot in consecutive years. Yeah, and even if you're a new gardener out there, you need to understand this because this would be very important on you being successful. Understand rotation, how important it is, and go ahead and start that practice early on, and that'll help you a lot. Now there's a few YouTubers out there that will say that what we do is what they call monocropping or, or planting the same family in the same plot. And they'll say that a lot of the square foot gardening uh, proponents will do this. So say this table here is a raised bed. They say that you should plant all different kinds of stuff in there because some things are going to have different pests than others and it, it, it basically confuses the pests and the diseases. I don't basically, I, I, I don't necessarily subscribe to that theory. I think you should plant the same family in the same spot because each family of crops has their own fertilizer needs, has their own water needs. I don't want to plant onions beside carrots because I'm going to give the onions a lot more nitrogen than I am the carrots. I'm going to give the onions a lot more water. So that's why I don't necessarily believe in planting all this different stuff in amongst one another and making this little vegetable jungle because everything has its own set of needs. And that's why I think rotations are really important. Yeah, monocropping in my mind is when you plant the same crop in the same spot year after year. Yeah. Yeah, just cotton, 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 cotton. Cotton, 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 yeah. Okay, so let's talk about the families we're working with when we're talking about cool season crops and rotations. So the first one, you got your alliums, and that's your onions, your leeks, your garlic, and your shallots, basically. Even some of those uh, heirloom bunching onions and stuff you got. Then you got your brassicas, which is your biggest category, and that's everything. Uh, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, cauliflower, kohlrabi, turnips, radish, rutabaga, mustard, and I might be missing a couple there, but that, that's your big one. That's the one you're going to struggle with the most as far as rotation because there's so much stuff in there that we like to plant in the fall garden. Are those also considered in the cold family, C-O-L-E, cold crops? Uh, yes, yes. I, now I'm, I, cold crops may be even more specific than brassicas. I'm not really sure uh, if that is a scientific term or that's just kind of a layman's term. I always thought it meant all the ones that you just mentioned. Oh, maybe it does. Maybe it does. Maybe somebody out there could help us out with that distinguishment there. The next one are the amaranths. Uh, this is not a huge family. You just got beets, chard, and spinach. That was pretty easy to rotate because it's only three members. You got your umbellifers, and the only real one we grow a lot of out there is carrots, but uh, includes parsnips, uh, cilantro, parsley, and dill. You got your legumes, which really the only you know fall legume we have is English peas, uh, and then you've got lettuce, which is in the daisy family. So we got you know six families there we got to work with, which is good. You know you want to be able to plant. You want to try to plant something from all six of these families. If you just planted all brassicas, then your rotation is pretty constrained. You can't really do a whole lot. But if you plant something from each of these families, you can rotate them as one crop expires, come in with something from another family. So a decent rotation would be broccoli, Brussels sprouts, anything from the brassica family, 
And follow it up with most of the daisy family? Sure, sure. And I'll go over in a, a sample rotation a little bit that I like to do in my garden. I never really thought about using lettuce as a rotation with Nebraska's, but I guess because we've got uh, a lot of lettuce. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I always like to have lettuce in the garden, uh, succession planting fall throughout the winter so some things to consider here as you kind of determine where you're going to plant stuff and what your rotation is going to be and some of these crops come off pretty fast now your onions and stuff you plant them in the fall they there for a long time carrots same way but some of these things beets lettuce uh kohlrabi stuff like that's going to come off pretty fast and you need to have a game plan together what you're going to put there once once those are done so first thing to consider is what is the maturity date? So you want to try to schedule or try to plant crops with similar maturity dates in the same plots. Like we said, your beets, your lettuce, uh, kohlrabi, some mustard, some of those are going to come off really, really fast compared to some others like your Brussels sprouts that are going to take a lot longer uh, to come off and mature. So think about the maturity date and, and, and try to plant things together that have a similar maturity date or plan your successions around similar maturity dates. The other thing to think about is, uh, is the crop you're planting a repeat harvest crop or a one-time harvest crop? Uh, for the most part, I try to plant my repeat harvest crops in the same plot or in the same general area. And then I plant my one-time harvest crops in a general area. Uh, and that just helps, you know, I'm, that way I'm not trying to rotate, squeezing things around those repeat harvest crops. They're all there in one spot. Give me an example of what repeat harvest crops uh, we have for the fall. Uh, and some of these can go both ways, and I'll try to mention that when that comes. Collards, for me, collards is a repeat harvest crop. I know some folks will till a spot, throw some seed, and one cut them, but uh, for me, it's a repeat harvest crop. Kale is a repeat harvest crop. Mustard and any of your greens mixes, you can cut those at least three or four times. Baby lettuce, if you're growing baby lettuce for cutting and coming again, that's repeat harvest. English peas, obviously. Spinach can be cut multiple times, and so can chard. Chard is one of those hardy, man, if you're having trouble growing any of these, if you can't grow a chard, you're in bad shape. The white flies don't seem to bother the chard. The easiest one to grow out there, and that's not my favorite one to eat, but it's definitely the easiest one to grow, and it's the most colorful, too. Uh, yeah, we got the rainbow, which makes a nice big one. We've also got a variety called Ruby Fresh Baby Swiss chard. You can grow like the cut and coming in greens, mm -hmm. nice and tender. Then we've got our one-time harvest things, which we try to plant together. Um, and for these, we have beets and broccoli. Now, I know some people like to milk the broccoli for all it's worth with the side shoot production or whatever. For the most part, broccoli is a one-time one harvest crop. Brussels sprouts, cabbage, cauliflower, carrots, kohlrabi, uh, leeks. Man, if, if y'all have never grown leeks, fall's a great time to grow leeks, and you need to be growing some of those. Those are awesome to eat. Uh, your garlic, your lettuce is one-time harvest, head lettuce is at least. Uh, radish is one-time harvest. Rutabagas, I put a little question mark beside that because you can multiply, you can repeatedly harvest the greens, but the actual rutabaga is a one-time harvest. You know, a lot of people are eating rutabaga greens now, just the greens. I think rutabagas are making a comeback, and I want to be part of that movement. You I, do? You want to be the rutabaga movement? I, I, want, I want to be kind of pushing that movement. I'm a, yeah. Uh, uh, I think they're, they're I making think they a comeback. I have a lot to offer, I really do. They've been overlooked or shunned over the last few years. You know, my generation, when we <coughs> thought about rutabagas, all you could think about was that huge root that came from a grocery store that you had to have an ax to cut up. Made the house smell like a toot. Yeah, and it, they, it had this wax, thick wax coating on it. You had to get that wax coating off of it, and I guess that was to preserve it. That's why we've always thought about rutabagas. Man, if you ain't ever eat them, the smaller roots, this homegrown with those greens mixed mm -hmm. together, man. The ones I grow don't make the house smell like a toot. Now, I don't know what they put in the commercial ones to make that happen, but uh, for some reason, the ones I grow, they don't stink up the house. They're tootless variety. Tootless, yeah. <laughs> so, we got those one time harvest things, we got those multiple harvest things. <clears throat> The, the multiple harvest things are going to be there for a while. You're going to pick those all throughout the fall and winter. The one-time harvest things, those are the things you really got to focus on your rotation with. What you're going to plant next after those. Um, so I put a few tips together here. 
as far as planning out your cool season garden. First one, and this is a big one, plant all your alliums together. Okay, they're gonna be there for a while. They got their own little set of nutrient and water needs. They gonna need a lot of water, okay? They gonna need a little bit of 20, 20, 20 to start off and then you gonna hit them with that ammonium sulfate. You really ain't gonna wanna put ammonium sulfate on your other stuff in my opinion. Right. I just put it on my alliums. So they all have similar nutrient needs. Those nutrients, you not, might not necessarily wanna put that on everything else. Certainly you don't wanna put ammonium nitrate on something like carrots, cause you have all top. Um, so plant all your alliums together, your onions, your elephant garlic, which we should have, uh, you got a estimated date? Well, we think we're gonna have them by the 15th of September. That would be great. So your onions, your elephant garlic, your leeks. Now leeks do, you can succession plant leeks. I did it last year. I had three or four crops of leeks from fall throughout the uh, next year spring. Uh, but your onions gonna be there for a while. But if you do bunching onions, you know, they'll come off. You can succession plant them. But uh, because all these things have similar nutrient water needs, I say plant all your alliums together. Just makes it easier to take care of them and treat them all the same. Number two, and this is another big one, plant your long-term brassicas together. Now, what do I mean about long-term brassicas? Brussels sprouts, man. Brussels sprouts is definitely a long-term brassica. You're going to plant those rascals in the fall and they're going to be ready sometime uh, January, February. About, about <coughs> six to eight weeks after you give up on them. Yeah, that's right. You're going to forget about them and you're going to go out there one day and you're going to have something. Uh, the other two, what I consider long-term brassicas are collards and kale and that's just because the repeat harvest you just get you know, harvest over and over and over for those guys. You, the stalks will get, you know, by the time next April rolls around, you'll have five foot tall stalks if you take good care of them. So plant those together because they're going to be in the same spot for a while. They're not going anywhere. Number three, if you are going to overwinter carrots like I do, and I plant mine in October, plant all your carrots together. Plant all your carrot rows side by side, just like you do your alliums. They're going to be there for a while. You kind of want to treat them the same as fertilizer. You don't need to give them too much nitrogen because you want a carrot root, not a bunch of top. And um, plant all your carrots together. The fourth tip here I've got is to find, this is kind of what you were alluding to earlier, find an easy rotation of relatively quick maturing crops that you like to eat. Don't grow something you don't like to eat. Now this is one that I like, okay? And this could be different from everybody else. But this is a rotation I like to do. And I don't really have a name for it. We call it the LBB rotation. Lettuce, beets, and brassicas. And this is a short-term brassica. This ain't collard greens, kale. This is something like uh, kohlrabi, cabbage, broccoli. Something that's going to come off relatively fast. So. In any garden, let's imagine this was a small garden plot and I had uh, three rows in it, okay? In this first row, the, my first planting that I'm gonna do whenever it cools off, I'm gonna plant lettuce in the first row, I'm gonna plant beets in the second row, and I'm gonna plant, let's say, broccoli in the third row. When these get done, or as they get done, and they're not gonna get done all at the same time, but relatively close, when the lettuce gets done, I'm going to have some beet transplants ready to go in that spot. When my beets get done, I'm going to have another short-term brassica, maybe some cauliflower, some kohlrabi to go in that spot, or that row. And when this, this brassica right over here gets done, I'm going to have some lettuce ready to go in that spot. And then after this second planting is done, then I'm going to put brassica where I had the beets, lettuce where I had the brassica the second time, and beets where I had the lettuce. So you could take a really small garden spot grow and grow a heap of food, have an awesome rotation here, and, and you could cater this however you want. It doesn't have to be lettuce, beets, and brassicas. Just, it needs to be 
crops with similar shorter maturity dates you can set up a plan like this and man have tons of food in a small amount of space so in the last couple of weeks everybody's been thinking about the fall plan and speaking of some of the things you just mentioned about they would call in or they would email and they would ask a lot of questions about what i need to plant when they plant it and we got this collection right here that makes it real easy so if you're looking to plant a good fall garden if you want to make it easy on yourself order this collection here and in this particular collection you got sugar prince pea and english peas you got early round dutch cabbage which is one of my favorite open pollinated varieties you got some swiss chard here that ruby fresh uh, baby swiss chard and you got some carrots uh -huh. got some cauliflower the snowball cauliflower and you got you some broccoli so you got everything that'll get you started on your fall garden that'd be right a fine there. fall garden yep. you got your little nice collectible tin there yep. we now all this the cool season now i will say based on seed availability sometimes the varieties in these will change maybe a little bit from month to month we try to keep it pretty much the same but if one variety becomes not as available they do change but we keep it updated on our website when you purchase it you can see all the varieties you're getting we've got lots of different collections beside the cool one we just added a sunflower collection but this one here is very very timely and one thing i like about it is it makes it easy to store the seeds you don't use you know you don't have to worry about putting them somewhere uh losing them all you don't have to use all the seeds in one packet at a time you can kind of close that back up pinch it off take this put it this in your refrigerator and uh you ain't got to worry about them spilling anywhere or anything it's just takes a little bit of the thinking out of it. it makes it easy on you that's what we're all about making it easy on you for sure okay and plus you get a little price break <clears throat> right yeah yeah it is cheaper than than buying all six or seven of those varieties individually so if y'all have any more questions about cool season rotations uh let me know in the comments below we'll have some more shows coming up on cool season gardening um we'll probably do a show talking about what to transplant what to direct seed that's very important yes, um We'll maybe even just do a, a show, a, a straight demonstration on cool season seed start. And that would be a good one to do. Just kind of revisit that subject a little bit. Uh, fertilization schedules for cool season crops. Everybody's curious about that. And then before too long, come October, we'll be thinking about cool season cover crops mm. in the spots we're not going to plant any food yeah, crops. Boy, down in our area here in Zone 8, I can tell you this, the sweet spot on you, those cover crops is one crops is October 1st through october 15th that is the ideal sweet spot of planting i always tell people uh as far as cool season cover crops go i like to you want to aim for uh anywhere from a month and a half to two months before your frost what you think your frost date is going to be that way you get them things up and going they can take a little bit of that early frost but once your hard frost going to get it's going to bite them down now down here we don't get any of those real hard frosts uh, but you know aim anywhere from a month and a half to two months before your first frost day it's a good time to get those cool season cover crops in the ground we'll talk more about those as that time comes but i don't really have any questions this week i kind of ate up all the questions on my weekly instagram uh segment that i've been doing um if you want to catch that on instagram and facebook 10 a.m. every morning I answer a question kind of elaborate on that a little bit one of our viewer questions so what we're going to do is uh, next week's show I I'd like to answer a bunch of questions and do a little bit of a giveaway a giveaway another giveaway yeah so uh, if you got any question anything gardening anything gardening put those in the comments below and I'll show you what we're going to give away maybe entice you a little bit so as we've been cleaning up the warehouse moving stuff around we kind of stumbled upon some things we used to sell that we don't necessarily sell anymore uh, that we've got a few of and uh you might want that puppy right there is sharp oh this this thing here is american made and it's made of high carbon steel called the survival tool it's got a little chisel, chisel in, in there the sharpie on the front that's a bad boy right there comes with a nice nylon sheath uh, i think it's got Oh, that's hickory handle or not? It's got a wood Careful handle. Careful, don't drop that thing. You could use that for uh, butchering chickens. You could or... use that for anything. Yeah, yeah. Anything within uh, the 
the rules of law. <laughs> then we got this nice little hatchet here. We're gonna give away a nice little condor hatchet. These puppies come sharp right out of the box. Comes with that, comes with the leather sheath. And then So how are we gonna give these away? And then hold on, I got one more thing to show. You love give stuff away, don't you? And then we got this nice little double bit axe here, which is nice little Now a lot of people don't know what the purpose of having an axe with two blades on it is. And um, do you? Oh, yeah, I do know. Well, I do know. You well, you got one, you keep one real, real sharp, uh, and you keep one a little bit dull for you kind of hacking and whatever. You need one real sharp for maybe splitting kindling or something like that. I'm glad you got that right. I was a little worried about yeah, you there, yeah, Todd. You got yeah. a good, good deal. I have a double bit. I, I think I have one of these in my uh, toolbox, yep. my truck. Yep. yep. And this is not a real long axe, so the handle on there yep. is just perfect for a truck axe. So what we're going to do, we're going to answer a bunch of questions, assuming our, our, um, our viewers cooperate. We're going to answer a bunch of questions, and then we'll draw three names or three numbers out of the hat, and uh, we'll give away, you know, one, two, three to those three numbers we get. So everybody put your questions in the comments. These are some top-notch tools here. Um, yeah, and with uh, wintertime coming up, you want to make sure you got your... Camping season. Boy, I got a I got camping itch. Uh, camping season's coming up on us and uh, outdoors and being outside in the fall, you're going to want you one of these. So yep. y'all stay tuned for next week's show. We'll give away one of those. Hope everybody did enjoy tonight's show. And if you did, always make sure you give us a big thumbs up. Hit that uh, subscribe button if you haven't already. Hit that bell button so you get notified every time we come out with a new video. And if you enjoyed tonight's show, check out these other two videos right here. I think you'll really enjoy those as well. We'll Thank see you, you next time.